So welcome to the fifth lecture of a series on Maimonides, his life and thought. And to continue from last week, we are looking at the laws of deot, or ethical qualities, or dispositions. Um, we had um, uh, looked at um, number uh, six in the end of chapter two. Um, number seven, he is talking about not engaging in jesting and mockery on the one hand, and not being melancholy and mournful on the other hand, but should be cheerful, okay? Um, Maimonides was not somebody who really liked to, you know, again, we would find him a bit ascetic, um, and so he was not really interested in what you might call idle talk, even small talk. Um, later on, of course, he's going to talk about the issues of gossip and slander. Um, but, um, you know, he's not uh, that much interested in, you might say, the secular, uh, secular activities, which uh, contemporaries of his did, uh, did do, you know, secular poetry, um, symposia, I mean, we've talked, I talked about that initially, the whole culture of Andalusia uh, included this notion that men could get together in a beautiful garden, drink wine, have nice foods, sniff, sniff great fragrances, be served by beautiful um, serving women and young men, uh, recite poetry, discuss things of, you know, import or not. Uh, wit was important, and certainly uh, Maimonides himself could be quite witty in his own letters. Um, but he, um, again, the Mishnah Torah, he's, he's, this is a public code that he's publishing, so he's trying to publish the ideal. And as I think I pointed out earlier, uh, some of the things he lays down as law in his commentary on the Mishnah and in the Mishnah Torah, in his actual court cases, he was more lenient. Um, which shows you the value of giving the judge discretion to judge. Uh, <laughs> which, as we have a judge here, uh, I think you would agree, would you not, Harvey? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When they start to put uh, mandatory sentences and your uh, uh, discretion taken away, there's no need for a judge. Exactly. It could be a computer sitting up there, right? Yeah, they tried that one time. Oh, really? <laughs> they were talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God that didn't come about. Okay, so let's take a look at chapter 3, because here he deals with a very interesting issue, that of asceticism in a very strict sense, which was quite well known in his day amongst all the Abrahamic traditions, uh, that there were people who decided uh, to live a, an ascetic life. And of course, you have a long tradition of asceticism in all the Abrahamic traditions. One of the things that we, uh, one of our um, kind of misinterpretations of Judaism is the idea that Jews were never ascetics. That's not true. In fact, Christian asceticism um, has, uh, has partly has its origin in, in Second Temple Jewish asceticism. We know of the Essenes, who were, uh, who, amongst whom the elite of the Essene community were celibate. They certainly lived a monastic existence if they were the people of Qumran. Um, we know from Philo in Egypt, there was a group called the Therapeutae, who were a kind of monastic group, but they were co-ed, so to speak. They were men and women. Um, and even the rabbinic tradition through the Pharisees has a certain ascetic stream in it. Um, there's a fine book on Jewish asceticism uh, by Dr. Eliezer Diamond, who teaches at the Jewish Theological Center some years ago. He published a paper on asceticism in rabbinic Judaism, which is quite good. I'd read some of the papers he based on. I haven't read the whole book yet. But um, it shows that there's a stream of asceticism running through our tradition. Certainly, um, philosoph Jewish philosophers practiced a certain amount of it, like Maimonides. Again, a kind of moderate asceticism, as you will see. Um, but also Jewish mystics. So... Um, <coughs> the idea that somehow, you know, we never did this is completely foreign. The one thing that we didn't have in the rabbinic period are celibate monastic communities because our tradition did not believe in celibacy, uh, strict celibacy. Although there is one <coughs> rab famous rabbi who was discussed in the Talmud who never got married <coughs> because of his love for Torah, so to speak. So, uh, again, we have, we have to understand that's kind of, and, it, and in Maimonides' own day, 
Um, you had Christian monastics in Egypt. You had Sufi and other Islamic ascetics. And you had Jews who were attracted to Sufism. That was one of the biggest spiritual challenges to the Jewish community <clears throat> in Maimonides' own day was the uh, attractiveness of Sufism. And in fact, his own son, Abraham, in his uh, writing and theology, was heavily influenced by Sufism. What was the attraction? Uh, the kind of approach to religion and spirituality, the, the, the Sufi, um, uh, you know. And by the way, it had already entered into the Sufism, had already entered into the Jewish spiritual tradition through the work of the Spanish philosopher from the previous century to Maimonides, Bahia ibn Pakuda, who wrote one of the most influential spiritual works in the Middle Ages, The Duties of the Heart, the Chavot Levavot in Hebrew. Again, it was originally written in Arabic. And uh, ibn Pakuda definitely shows he, can, he, he had read uh, many um, both Greek sources and uh, Sufi sources in writing that book. Risa, you had a question. Yes, please. I've always been puzzled <clears throat> why most of the conservative voices in Judaism as well as the other Abrahamic faiths yeah. imagine that it's displeasing for God for us to enjoy ourselves. Well, um, that's a very, very good question. In other, and, and then the question you have to ask is, what does it mean to enjoy ourselves? In other words, um, uh, no, no, those are for the, for the oh, analysis. Thank you. Um, uh, the question is, what does it mean to enjoy ourselves? And uh, a, a, serious, a serious spiritual seeker um, will um, see in everything they do a means of serving and worshiping God. And that often leads to a kind of ascetic approach to life. And that's exactly what he's going to talk about when we start reading this chapter. Well, okay? but it's, it's exactly that that I'm asking if you, if you would like to, for you to speak to. Well, I understand that there's the danger of overdoing. Right. But there's not the necessity to overdo. Well, it was a question of trying to lead what we would call a very, uh, a life seriously committed to God in a way that, again, I fully agree. We don't find it, um, most of us do not find it attractive, but there are still people today who are attracted by a kind of rigorous um, obedience to their tradition in a, in a, in a rather... Um, and again, it can go to completely to extremes. And it, but he wants to deal with that because even though by our standards he is fairly ascetic, he doesn't think so from his perspective, and he has people who are going f much further than him. So let's let's begin reading chapter three. So Suzanne, you want to begin chapter three, uh, Halakha one. Okay. Possibly a person may say. Since envy, cupidity, and ambition are evil qualities to cultivate and lead to a man's ruin, I will avoid them to the uttermost and seek their contraries. A person following this principle will not eat meat or drink wine or marry or dwell in a decent home or wear comely apparel, but will clothe himself in sackcloth and coarse wool like the idolater's priests. This, too, is the wrong way not to be followed. Whoever persists in such a course is termed a sinner. So there it is. And when he talks about the idolaters' priests, he's referring to um, monks here, okay? Christian monks. Of the Nazarite, it is said, he, the priest, shall make atonement for him, for the sin that he committed against the soul. On this text, the sages comment, if the Nazarite who only abstained from wine stands in need of an atonement, how much more so one who deprives himself of all legitimate enjoyments? Okay, what is he talking about here? Uh, in the Torah, in the book of Numbers, there is a, um, uh, in chapter um, six, it talks about the, uh, the Nazarite. The Nazarite is someone who takes an oath to abstain from wine or grape products and not to cut his hair for about six months. And there are all kinds of rules about the Nazarite. Uh, we know of a couple of figures in the Bible who, uh, and th those are temporary Nazarites. 
There are a couple of figures in the Bible who are lifelong Nazarites, like Samuel is dedicated by his mother as a Nazarite. Samson is a Nazarite, although they don't follow quite all of the rules. And evidently, it was a form of asceticism that existed in late first temple times, early second temple times, for people who wanted, for one reason or another, to have a kind of ascetic life for a particular reason. We also know of a group um, of people who lived at the time of Jeremiah, just before the destruction of the temple, called the Rechabites, who were a kind of clan of ascetics who, in trying to emulate the patriarchs, didn't live in cities, uh, didn't eat cultivated food, only lived outside the cities in tents, and, but because of the war, and they didn't drink wine, um, but because of the war they were forced into, uh, uh, when the Babylonians came, they were forced out of their uh, tent dwellings into the city. And we learn about them because God says, go to the Rechabites and tell them to drink wine. And the Rechabites say, well, we've had this for generations, because apparently one of their ancestors started this whole thing. And God uses it as a kind of uh, analogy to say, look, here are the Rechabites who have an earthly covenant that they are loyal to, and everybody else, uh, the Judeans, can't live up to my, to my covenant. In other words, they're held up as an example of how you should be loyal to, um, to covenants sworn in ages past. And um, the general population has not done this. So the Rechabites are, and of course, again, once you get to the Second Temple period, there's evidence of uh, various groups practicing certain forms of asceticism. Yes? How did they make Kiddush? <laughs> they didn't. That's the point. They didn't make Kiddush. That, that didn't exist back then. Uh, saying Kiddush uh, for Shabbat didn't exist. So it wasn't an issue with them. Um, and we don't, we don't know anything else about them other than their, what it says in the book of Jeremiah. But um, it, it's quite fascinating. So, amongst the rules of the Nazarite, it says that when his period comes, one of, he has to bring certain sacrifices and things to the temple. And one of the things he has to do is a sin offering. So the rabbis say, well, here is a guy who just went through this ascetic period, you know, who's tried to purify himself. What sin did he commit? And the rabbis, in effect, say, you know, um, how it's because of his abstention from wine. You know, that this is something that God gave us to enjoy life. You know, and again, if you don't overindulge in it, it's an, a joyful thing. So if he has to do atonement, even more so, this is, again, the rabbis, you know, what's called the kal v'chomer. If, if this was needed atonement, how much more so than someone who deprives himself of all legitimate enjoyments. Read on, Suzanne. Um, the sages accordingly enjoined us that we should only refrain from that which the Torah has expressly withdrawn from our use. And no one should, by vows and oaths, inhibit to himself the use of things permitted. Do not the prohibitions of the Torah, say our sages, suffice you that you add others for yourself? In this condemnation, those are included who make a practice of fasting. They, too, are not walking in the right way. Our wise men prohibited self-mortification by fasting. And concerning this and similar excesses, Solomon exhorts us, Be not over-righteous nor excessively wise. Wherefore should you be desolate? And fasting is a very common form of ascetic practice and is found quite... Um, a lot in um, certain circles, um, especially in Kabbalistic circles, mystic circles. Um, there are uh, men who used to fast uh, from Shabbat to Shabbat. They would drink water, but they would eat no food except on Shabbat, because you're, you're prohibited from fasting on Shabbat. There were others, there was a fairly common practice of uh, much more common um, than, you know, kind of s severe ascetics of fasting on Mondays and Thursdays, the days which the Torah is read. So uh, the use of, and of course, we do have our fast days, but um, only two of them, we have six fast days in the Jewish calendar, but only two of them are actually obligatory. And those are the two 24-hour fasts of Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur. The other four fasts are actually not obligatory in the rabbinic tradition, but of course, most Jews who are observant take them on anyway, 
and take them on as obligatory. Those are 18-hour fasts, um, more like the Muslim uh, fast of Ramadan, where you fast from sunrise to sunset, as opposed to sunset to sunset. Yes, Robert? How, how does this fit in with our obligatory fast days? Um, this, our obligatory fasting is not covered under here because it's very specifically in the Torah says you're supposed to fast on Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av it was at, you know, was considered an obligatory fast as well uh, but none of the others are actually, yeah. Is that because they're <clears throat> communal fasts and that the sin of uh, personal asceticism is of sort of putting yourself above <coughs> others? Yeah, it could. Well, no, it's not. Yeah, it's, yeah. Don't be overly righteous, but also despairing, uh, disdaining the things in the world that God gave you. By the way, there's another thing. People, it is is a, it was a long established practice, which some people still do, of fasting on the yort site for a relative. In addition to uh, going to shul and saying kaddish and giving tzedakah, it was a custom also to fast what on the yort site. Woman before the wedding. Yeah, yeah, it's true. There's also the uh, groom uh, and the bride. They're supposed to fast on the day of their wedding because it's like a Yom Kippur for them. It, it, you know, all previous sins are kind of remitted, uh, and they start off with a you know clean slate. So there are other. Uh, thank you for reminding me of that, uh, Cantor. There, there are other. Um, you know, there's all the other kinds of those things. Yeah. This statement you just read is sort of reminds me of the facetious statement about the difference between German law and French law. The, no, I haven't uh, heard that. Okay, under German law, whatever is not allowed is forbidden. <laughs> and under French law, whatever is not forbidden is allowed. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, and I think American law right? is the same thing, is it not, Harvey? That if something isn't prohibited, uh, specifically prohibited by law, it's, there's, you know. Until you cut. What? Until you're, <laughs> Until you're caught, or somebody decides it's bad for you. <laughs> yes. When he, when he talks about fasting, mm -hmm. um, What's the time frame that he's talking about? Six hours between meals? No, that no. He's talking about uh, variations of a whole day fast, an 18 hour, like a 24 hour fast, an 18 hour fast, multiple fastings over a period of time. Um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, he himself, remember in his letters, talked about how he gets up in the morning and goes to the court and he, he doesn't eat anything. That's not because he's fasting, but because. He can't eat the food there, so it's not like he really wants to, but he's forced to. Um, so it's he here. He's taking a strong stand against asceticism. Okay. Now let's take a look at the number two, which I gave you in the in the handout. Um, <clears throat> which he didn't put in here. So Irma, do you want to read it? Um, here. On page one of the material. Laws of ethical conduct. Yes, chapter 3, Halakha 2. Okay. A person should direct his heart and the totality of his behavior to one goal, becoming aware of God, blessed be he. Now that's very important. He's rejected extreme asceticism, but he has said, the goal of life is to become aware of God, right? That for him is the highest ideal, um, which in fact, at the end of the guide, he talks about um, that, in effect, you are, and there's a kind of, people often contrast, you know, mysticism with philosophy, but there is a kind of mystic quality to philosophical spirituality, to become aware of God to the greatest possible extent. The person who became the most aware or apprehended God was, of course, Moses. But the goal of life, the meaning of life, is in everything you do, is to reach as close to that state as you are capable of intellectually and spiritually. So we might see this as a kind of asceticism if this is the goal of everything in life. Read on, because it shows you what he includes in this. The way he rests, rises, and speaks should all be directed to this end. For example, when involved in business dealings or while working for a wage, he should not think solely of gathering money. Rather, he should do these things so that he will be able to obtain that which the body needs, food, <clears throat> drink, a home, and a wife. In other words, <clears throat> you're, you should not love the acquisition of money for the acquisition of money, but only for the practical ends which you will be able to achieve, which are part and parcel of the proper life according to Jewish tradition. Including a wife. Including a wife, to a be married. In other words, again, this is against... No, this is against celibacy, okay? Go on. 
Similarly, when he eats, drinks, and engages in intimate relations, he should not intend to do these things solely for pleasure, to the point where he will eat and drink only that which is sweet to the palate and engage in intercourse for pleasure. Rather, he should take care to eat and drink only in order to be healthy in body and limb. Therefore, he should not eat all that the palate desires, like a dog or a donkey. Rather, he should eat what is beneficial for the body, be it bitter or sweet. Conversely, he should not eat what is harmful to the body, even though it is sweet to the palate. For example, a person with a warm constitution should not eat meat or honey, nor drink wine, as Solomon has stated in a parable. The eating of much honey is not good. One should drink endive juice, even though it is bitter, for then he will be eating and drinking for medical reasons only, in order to become healthy and be whole. For a man cannot exist without eating and drinking. And remember what he said in his previous things, that overeating amongst those who can afford it is one of the things that causes the most illnesses in humans. So... Again, he, he's, not interested, he's not interested in a gourmet approach to food. Food for him has a very practical and functional goal to fill the body's needs and to keep it in good health. And therefore, if you are of certain constitutions, therefore you should avoid certain kinds of foods because your humors, remember we looked at the charts about the various kinds of humors and how they effect turn people into various kinds of inherent characteristics. Um, therefore, if you are of, two, of one kind, you should eat to kind of balance that out. Again, this is part of the whole notion of the, the balance. You should seek a kind of balance in both body and soul. All right? So now he's going to come to sex. Similarly, he should not have intercourse except to keep his body healthy and to preserve the human race. Therefore, he should not engage in intercourse whenever he feels desire, but when he knows that he requires a seminal emission for medical reasons or in order to preserve the human race. Now, here's where Maimonides goes against the rabbinic tradition, right? There is very, very clear in the rabbinic tradition that it is perfectly acceptable to have sex for pleasure with your wife, right? Maimonides is really the only one of the only people who say that its primary reason is for um, procreation. And medical reasons. Yes, but for and him health. it's primary for medical reasons. And in fact, in another place he even says that during sex you should focus on, again, connecting with, that you should be focusing on that you're doing this for procreation. That's Catholic just a little, little yeah. yes, it's, it does. Yes, Suzanne's <laughs> right. It does approach a kind of Catholic perspective. Um, the Catholic perspective is that sex is only for reproduction, and in fact, there was a Catholic doctrine, much ignored, that when a couple, uh, a married couple, is beyond childbearing years, they're supposed to then be celibate, and not to have sex with each other. John Paul II tried to revive that idea. It's still on the books, but it, his campaign failed miserably. Yes, Brian. Any evidence of how Mrs. Maimonides felt about having such a romantic We husband? don't even know her name. <laughs> okay. Um, the, uh, but the other thing is, is that there was a, a, a book written in the 13th century called the Igerita Kodesh, the Holy Letter. It's um, attributed to Nachmanides, but he didn't write it. It's an unknown writer. Um, uh, I don't remember whether it was, uh, scholars believe it was written in France or in uh, Spain. It's heavily influenced by Kabbalah. There's no doubt about it. But it's basically about sex. And um, although it, you know, brings in sexuality into a whole, the whole Kabbalistic system, and there is a, 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 you know, that's a whole other issue, the sexuality that is in a lot of Kabbalistic uh, symbolism, in the book it specifically says Maimonides was wrong. That sex for pleasure is a good thing and even gives people hints on how to do better at it. It's a sex, there, it's, with all of its circumlocutions, the, the last part of the book is a, a manual for achieving good sex. But I'm, I'm trying to really, I think there's a broader point here in that he, 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 he seems to 
set aside the whole idea that it's good to make other people feel good. It's a good thing to affirm other people, to nurture other people, Absolutely. to help other people. It's just, it's just you and, and getting your body in perfect shape, and then you and God, and, and everyone else to help with them. But this is where Maimonides is, is, by our standards, rather ascetic. Well, I, I would call it Well, he, he does give you a way out, Rabbi. He says you should not have intercourse except to keep his body healthy. So he gi right, gives you... Right. There's a fudge factor. Right, but it's not... But, is, it's is not uh, but you're not supposed to do it when you, whenever you desire, you see. Um, it, and, and what's interesting is, of course, that um, there's a whole category... Um, within uh, the Jewish tradition called going beyond the letter of the law, right? Where you're supposed to um, not only follow the law, but even go further than it and be merciful. But there's a, the negative uh, flip side of it is, there's a fascinating li a little expression called naval bereshut ha-Torah, a scoundrel within the boundaries of Torah. <laughs> and Nachmanides in his commentary to Leviticus 19 describes this idea that, you know, you, you follow the Torah, but, you know, within the, the boundary of the laws of Torah, for example, he says, you could become a glutton. You know, you keep kosher, you keep the law, but you could become a complete glutton. Likewise, he said, you could become basically a, a complete, as long as it's, you keep it with your wife, you could, like, have sex any time you wanted within the restrictions, of course, of the purity laws. And, and, and he, you know, and treat your basic, you know, treat your wife, you know, be like an animal, basically. And so Nachmanides, in effect, saying you should not be a Naval Barashuta Torah, right? But, and but, he's sort of reflecting somewhat of an influence of Maimonides here, but also, generally speaking, is that even though, the, again, you don't, the Torah only, you should only follow what the Torah prohibits, he's also saying, you know, you should learn to go a little higher than that in your behavior. But it's all about me, me. Yeah, me. It's no, no. that's Brian's point is that there's no sense, there's no discussion of interpersonal what the relations. Yes, there's of certainly no no even consideration of intimacy. Right? Well, but that's it's the point. about this one guy. The, and the Gerda Kodesh actually goes into that the notion of intimacy with the wife and making sure she has pleasure. But of course, in rabbinic tradition, the idea that the wife has sexual rights, in other words. There is a whole discussion in rabbinic literature about mm -hmm. the obligation a man has to have sex with his wife, and depending upon your job, the uh, the you know the obligation is more or less, right? Whether your job is is well, well, which jobs? <laughs> <laughs> well, for example, if you're a sailor, you only have an obligation to have sex with your wife one every six months because you're going to be away a lot. You know what I mean? In other words, it goes. It, there's a whole bunch of these things. It's quite fascinating because the rabbis, of course you know, very typically for them, want to co sort of, um, you know, discuss uh, legal boundaries and minimums and maximums and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But according to rabbinic tradition, a man has an obligation to his wife to give her sexual satisfaction. It's in the Ketubah. It's in the Ketubah, exactly. So Maimonides here is going against the normative tradition. That's what's fascinating about it. All right, let's, let's look at number three. Uh, Harvey, do you want to read number three on page 57? He who regulates. He who regulates his life in accordance with the laws of hygiene, with the sole motive of maintaining a sound and vigorous physique, and begetting children to do his work and labor for his benefit, is not following the right course. A man should aim to maintain physical health and vigor in order that his soul may be upright, in a condition to know God. For it is impossible for one to understand sciences and uh, meditate upon them when he's hungry or sick or when any of his limbs are, uh, is aching. That, this is a good point. In other words, and this you will see in the guide, that Maimonides has both what you might call a pers agenda for the individual but also for society. When a person is starving or sick or in a situation of war or um, uh, where the society is broken down, you don't have time for science and philosophy. So he wants to create both within the individual and within society, that's his political agenda, which comes up very clearly in the third part of the guide. For him, the laws are functional. They lead to something. They are not to be followed in and of themselves. And here, um, there is a very interesting division within the Jewish tradition dating even back, I would say, to the Bible, but certainly in the rabbinic tradition. Why do we follow the commandments of God? One answer is 
You do it because God said so, and their value is the following of them in themselves, and you, do not, you don't need to know the reason why. Okay? The other tradition stream tradition says, and by the way, this goes all the way up to today, there are reasons why God wants us to do these commandments. There's a whole literature uh, dating from the Middle Ages called books which describe ta'ame ha-mitzvot, the reasons or the rationale for the commandments. And those who fall under the latter category are a variety of different approaches um, from, you know, mystical reasons and so on but for my and so for them the law is functional it le it is it is not an end in itself but a means to an end and for Maimonides the means to the end is a healthy person in mind and body uh, or soul and body and a healthy society so that those few individuals who have the capability to do so will study the sciences and the philosophy and become the great uh, sages and wise men and even possibly the prophets. So, um, and again, I can show you literature today uh, from uh, Orthodox thinkers who say it's very nice to find reasons for the law, but that's not the point. If you believe that God commanded it, that's all you need to know. Yes, Whereas uh, 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 Leibovitch and Norman Lamb, for example, um, Whereas when you look at somebody, uh, a modern kind of exponent of the, uh, aside from the, the Kabbalists, if you take a look at Mordechai Kaplan's approach to the Jewish tradition, he doesn't call them mitzvot anymore, but for him, they are functional. They have a reason within, um, you know, either they are moral in a general sense or they are there to maintain the Jewish identity. Yeah, Sefer Achinuch. There's Sorry, a lot what, what, what of the book of the books called Sefer Achinuch, which I think is what 14th century. Um, there's a lot of books in the Middle Ages which attempt to go into the reasons for the commandments, um, but there is a strain of tradition that says you just follow it. Doesn't matter what it means. Now, in the Torah itself, I believe that most of the time, the Torah is seeking to give us reasons. It's what uh, one scholar called that. The law in the Torah is justified law. It's not just that the Torah says, do this, do this, do this, but so often it tells us why. Yeah, that's, there's a difference in some people, but again, th that, that's, that whole difference between laws which are considered uh, easy to understand and those that are not easy to understand. Um, Sa'aja Ga'on earlier in the Middle Ages says, you know, the ones that are easy to understand, the general moral laws, that we understand their rationale, the ones that we don't understand, we just do them anyway um, because God commanded them. And Maimonides is very much against that approach. He says all the laws have rational and functional reasons behind them, even if you don't know what they are or have trouble figuring it out. He says there's just those that are easier to understand and those that are more difficult. And he devotes a good part of the third of most of the third part of the guide to going through the commandments and telling you what they mean, it's right? Stuff like and all that kind of everything. He goes through everything. I think the one thing he says that the only person who really understood it um, was Solomon was the, the, the red heifer, Paradema. the paradama, the red heifer, the law in, in Numbers where if you touch a dead body, there's a whole process of purification which includes using the ashes of a red heifer, a, cow, a calf that had, was all the hair was, was, I would say, reddish brown, really. Um, you know, even I think even Maimonides has difficult figuring that one out. But the point is, he says, if you don't understand the reason for a law, it's because of your own, you know, you haven't done the, the work, you haven't studied it, or you're just mentally incapable of understanding it. And so that's one of his functions in the guide, is to give you the reasons for all the limits of what. So you will see that they are all rational, even the ones that seem incredibly irrational, like the paradigma, like the law against mixing wool and linen. And for Maimonides, many of these laws have pedagogical reasons to inculcate certain ideas and values. So um, anyway, that's, that's a bit of a, uh, a point. So let's, let's read on. And in cohabitation. And in cohabitation, one should set one's heart on having a son who may become a sage and a great man in Israel. So while you're having sex, that's what you should be thinking of. <laughs> bit of a killjoy there, isn't it? <laughs>
Go on. Whoever whoever throughout his life follows this uh, course will be continually serving God, even while engaged in business and even during cohabitation, because his purpose in all that he does will be to satisfy his needs uh, so as to have a sound body uh, which with which to serve God. Even when uh, he sleeps and s- seeks repose to calm his mind and rest his body so as not to fall sick and be incapacitated from serving God, his sleep is service to the Almighty. In that sense, or in this sense, one wise man charged, charged us, let us all let all, let all your deeds be for the sake of God. And uh, Solomon, in his wisdom, said, In all your ways know him, and he will make your path straight. Well, what he's talking about here is a kind of spirituality in which you, in effect, are God-intoxicated every moment of your life. Now, this is not an easy thing to do. and But again, it's an ideal. Um, later Jewish spiritual works you know, really talk about you becoming, as it were, a kind of empty vessel which is filled with God so that you, in effect, become an extension of God. That you're, you, I mean, th- this is where mysticism um, has, has a big influence. You, you annihilate your ego. You almost annihilate yourself. And you become a living embodiment of God wherever you are. Um, there's an interest, there's, there's an important, uh, again, phil- um, moral, what we call a musar, a kind of a book of, of morality and uh, moral spirituality from the 18th uh, century um, called by a guy named Moshe Luzzato, who was an Italian rabbi and a Kabbalist. Um, and it's called, I'm blanking on it. Um, anyway, it's based on a, on a passage in, in, in the Mishnah where it talks about various ladders of uh, spirituality. And he takes each one of those steps um, as um, a, a, a rung on, on a way to develop yourself to a higher level of spirituality. But he says there are going to be three groups of people. There's going to be 